the first time that I ever experienced Ulu in a new way was we were at the East West Center. Mm. We were setting up and you're like, eh, oh, la ye kavai is what it was. And you brought a jar, a quart jar of Ulu poke. Oh. And you had it and you're like, here, and you like shook some out at me. <laughs> and I was like, first off, I thought, I thought Ulu poke in a mason jar was totally gangster. I thought that was awesome. <laughs> Uh, but then, you know, after that, I was like, oh, that, you know, one, like, that was really good. I've had that, you know, as, as like, as like, call a poke, I've had that before. But, you know, sometimes the obvious, it takes, like, a friend or it takes another experience to, to bring the obvious to light. Yeah. After you did that, that was the beginning of starting to look at Ulu, like, how else, mm -hmm. you know, how else can we do it? I, I often think about that, too, like, using Ulu in different uh, methods and, and uh, cooking techniques, but for some reason, you know, my favorite is just really the, the most basic way to cook it right over the fire. And, you know, getting people to appreciate the ulu for its true flavor and the way that it's been cooked for generations upon generations. You don't necessarily need to, for me anyway, need to turn it into something different. Although, I mean, it's so versatile, you can do pretty much anything with it. What I really love about ulu, of, of all the canoe crops that there are, I think it is the most versatile for sure. There are so many things you can do with ulu. Like we could spend hours talking about all the different things you can make out of ulu. It's like you're getting three different food products in one. At the green stage, you can take it, dice it up, boil it. It's still kind of hard and rubbery, but it's a lot like artichoke hearts. But then as it gets mature, anything you can do with a potato, you can do with ulu. Only better, actually. I mean, chips, fries, you can mash it. We have a ulu jalapeno burger patty that is amazing. I make a ulu chowder that is really delicious, and ulu poke. And sometimes I'll use it to make ulu hummus, ulu mousse, ulu spreads, yeah. One of the nice things about ulu is that it's so much faster to cook and so much easier to clean and it pounds really well if you get the right stage. So. What is the stage that you look for to pound, to pound ulu? Ripe but not overripe. Um, if, if it gets a little soft and it's um, not as starchy. Yeah. As it starts to get softened and ripe and then sweeten, you can do a whole different approach to it. Mousses and incorporate it into breads, pancakes, you know, all kinds of stuff. About nine, ten years ago, I started getting really into um, my own diet and health. I have kind of a sweet tooth, so I really wanted to try and incorporate some of the um, healthier type desserts into my diet. So I just started experimenting. One day, I was out in Hana, and I, I picked up this bread food that was laying on the ground, and I put it in the back of my truck, and I kind of forgot about it. About three days later, when I got back to town, of course, I, I was cleaning out my truck and I looked and I found this breadfruit that was in the back and it was soft and aromatic and I, I pulled it apart and opened it and the smell was just amazing and I had this epiphany right then. I thought, wow, these raw pies I'm making, instead of using you know, imported cashews and agave, why don't I make it out of breadfruit, use local mac nuts and local honey? And that was the birth of Pono Pies. I would encourage other chefs to add ulu to their menu because it's a local food, you're supporting the local economy. It grows so well, it's so prolific. And we're isolated out in the middle of the ocean here and the more we can develop these local foods, these local resources, the more secure our future will be. My tip would be, after we would harvest them, I like to let it rest for 24 hours. I find that it doesn't bleed out as much when you cut it. Any type of a neutral oil will wipe off that gumminess of your knives real good. So that's my, that's my pro tip. I think what's really important for people to start to understand, even with taro or with sweet potato or any of the, the indigenous starches, is getting to know it in detail to the extent of seasonality and the ripeness and maturity of the fruit because you know a lot of people haven't gotten there yet it's either ripe or, or, or not. not being able to break out of that or know which fruit is better for a certain dish that's a direction that i would like to see people get to